Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's time for Kohantan's third lecture. Okay. Welcome back. Uh, okay, so I have the, the mission to help you go uh, through your digestion of your lunch. So let's see. Let's hope it's going to be uh, easy. So I'm, gonna, I'm just starting by the, the answers to the, re the exercise I left you with last, yesterday. Uh, here it is. Uh, I should just... <coughs> I also posted the results on the GitLab, where all the, the codes uh, are there. Uh, and so this is the answer of the metadoku, uh, essentially. So this one had three modes, and this one had four. And uh, you can find uh, so uh, four distinct uh, combination of uh, arrows, spins. Uh, and, uh, and, but you can also construct others by just linear superposition, uh, adding them, right? And you see that here, they all have this uh, rotating square mechanism where you have like two in, two out, also here, right? But on top of that, you have additional ones that exploit the, you know, this, uh, the fact that you have an extra uh, hinge here, which here, when you have an arrow on the diagonal uh, branch, that means that this extra hinge will be uh, activated, okay? And so you see that Whenever you don't have these pure rotating square modes, the only modes you have on top are those which actuate this extra extra hinge, either in the middle or on the side. Okay. Okay. And uh, as I was saying, it's kind of uh, fun to play with metadoku, but generally to find rules to define how many modes you have or the modes is actually very hard. That's what Ryan has. Uh, try to classify with machine learning. Even though we don't know the rules ourselves, somehow the machine learning algorithm seems to have figured it out, it's figured them out. <laughs> uh, and so uh, and what we are currently trying on pushing is to, for instance, uh, understand the rules ourselves. Uh, but uh, generally, uh, it seems to be more efficient to ask a neural network to do it for you. Yep. Um, OK. And so uh, yesterday, uh, well, this week, we did uh, First, intuition, zero modes. Then we went on to design, combinatorial design. Today, uh, on the menu is, uh, you know, what happens, you know, you design a metamaterial typically using linear framework, zero modes, and so on. But then in the lab, you actually smoosh them a lot. The, and the response becomes nonlinear. And so you create an object that you don't necessarily understand. And so that's, that's basically the, what we do today. So we'll, we'll survey a few examples of what happens beyond the linear response. A few of the you know, archety archetypical uh, phenomena you have, like buckling, uh, and beyond the unit cell. So you program a mechanism, but when in reality, when you print an object or cut it, uh, the mechanism you get uh, is not ideal. And so then I will discuss, I think, quite something quite universal about uh, what happens when when you make the mechanism out of real stuff. Okay, uh, and uh, and then we'll combine both. Tomorrow we'll move on. We'll switch gear and move on to active metamaterial, where we don't program the geometry, but we program the way we actually inject energy. Okay. Um, so first, first example. So this is if you if you program a metamaterial and you know compress it. Uh, sometimes when you're lucky, when you play, which is actually what happened for this example, uh, this is what happens. You have very large shape changes, very large instability. Okay. Uh, and so that's kind of a uh, typical of what happens. And that's also why it's actually interesting to do experiments and not only numerics, because some of those you actually are better off exploring experimentally rather than numerically. If you want to explore this numerically, you have to know in advance which instability will occur. You can do it, but uh, it's not necessarily as fast and efficient as doing, uh, as doing the experiment. And so that's why this field is actually an interesting combination of theory and experiments. And that's, that's I think, the, the best way to discover. Uh, another thing that happens is that if your sample gets large, actually, even though your mechanism in theory would be uniform, folding everywhere the same, uh, in reality, that's not necessarily the case. So uh, this is the, this famous rotating square mechanism. Uh, this is a 3D printed foot. Somehow I was, in, I was discussing with people making prosthetics. I was uh, absolutely wanted to print a foot. Uh, and if you... Uh, The movie wants to play. Ah, yes. 
it plays, right? What you see that what actually happens is that the foot is uh, exerting. Say it again. Ah, all right. Yeah, it was a bit. One place. Yeah. Let me see. No, somehow it's buggy, right? Oh, sorry about that. No, it's. <laughs> Yeah, okay, let me just pause it here. I can try to. So what you see is that the pressure that the foot exert, exerts, it's not uh, homogeneous. Uh, and so even though your mechanism you design to have like a uniform dilation, actually, that's not the case. So how, how do you actually describe this mechanism that's, you know, that's actually, uh, how do you describe you know, the, the, the extension of the mechanism is actually a real object, right? And uh, well, we'll discuss, I'll discuss more uh, in uh, details, you know, the, how you can do that. Um, but that's what we'll discuss in the second part, essentially. And I think that, you know, the, the reason why the rotations are not the same everywhere is kind of something that's very, that you will meet all the time, whatever geometry you use. And so I think to me that's kind of a, a very typical, uh, a very typical, uh, I think, attribute, okay? And so uh, let's come back to this mechanism. So the mechanism that you designed, this is the, the one that was under the foot, right? Uh, this is the one I will discuss later. So you have typically, in the ideal limit, in the mechanism limit, you assume these polygons, quads, uh, rotate about their vertices. Uh, and if, if uh, kinematically, if you allow for, for this to happen, then you can have a full mechanism, right? So, this is what one of the, the first, the one that is vastly studied, the one we you know uh, made variations from yesterday. This what I will discuss. This one is just you turn the squares into rectangle, and actually uh, people like Daniel Acuna here from uh, in, uh, Santiago, I don't remember the name of your university, but uh, showed that you can also extend this to actually disordered uh, disordered material. But these are still a mechanism, right? But in real life, so in, in, in these models, this costs zero energy to actually fold, right? Um, but in real life, you actually punch holes in the, in the rubber, and so, uh, you know, if you want to make a, you know, if you want to use this to absorb vibrations, which is actually a project we're currently uh, uh, investigating, this is what happens. You know, you shake it. It, 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 do, it does more, it has more motions than the one you actually program in the mechanism. But the first thing that happens is that actually it costs you a bit of energy to actually bend this because this ligament here, which is of rubber, will start to bend. So the material inside, uh, you know, will on each, on each side of the ligament, some will stretch, some will compress, and that will cost you some elastic uh, energy, okay? And so what I want to do today is just show you what is the simplest model you can actually use to describe those. And actually, these models are quite useful to learn and understand uh, the mechanics. And so the simplest model is maybe <laughs> decept deceptively simple. You just take two bars, right, that, that, that are inextensible bar, and you, you model uh, the joints between the bar. You, you say that it will cost you a bit of energy, OK? And so what I want to really quickly do is just do the textbook exercise uh, to actually describe the mechanics of this object. So go a step beyond just pure geometry. It gives it some elastic energy, okay? And so uh, this is my object, right? So I, and this is gonna be of length one half here, and also of length one half. And I will assume here uh, a torsional spring. of spring constant C, okay? Uh, and so what happens is that after a while you compress it. So you compress it here. Okay? With a certain force P, okay? And, uh, and uh, well, when you do that, there's a certain angle here theta, right? Uh, and uh, there's a certain displacement 
here that is basically one minus cos theta, right? That's just how you do it. And so how do you describe these mechanics? You basically write the elastic energy. So the elastic energy is just you know, the, the torsional spring, so you, it grows like the square of the angle times the spring constant, right? And then you have the work uh, of the force. Uh, all right. And the work of the force uh, is essentially the force times the displacement, okay? I, I put one half is my in my length of my bars. But for one half C theta squared, right? Anyway. Yeah. What? I mean, the, the spring constant is C. Yeah. And you have theta squared. Yeah. So, but, I mean, uh, your spring is going by two theta. Yeah, OK. Uh, so it's a constant. So maybe, maybe I should oh, write it like that. I should write it like that, maybe? Or maybe I just, this is maybe then my spring constant, probably? Yeah. See the yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I think it's, it's good to be uh, rigorous. I'm not very good at being rigorous, but I guess it's uh, OK. And so then what you can do is write you know, this uh, Lagrangian, which is energy minus the work, and then uh, write, you know, use Euler-Lagrange theorem. So this is the Lagrangian. Yeah. Which is basically telling you that the extrema of the Lagrangian with respect to your freedom will be your mechanical equilibria, right? Uh, and so when you do that, uh, you find zero equals theta minus p sine theta, okay? So this is good. That means that now I can express my mechanical equilibria here, right? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm... Uh, what do you mean? The yeah, okay. Um, what you, yeah, maybe. What you can write is you can also formulate this as a. Is is it easier if I say? Maybe I can not mention Euler-Lagrange, and I can use the principal work theorem, which is equivalent, right? which is variations of energy equal variation of work, right? And so uh, variation of energy here is partial derivative of the energy with respect to theta, right? Equals, that's actually more rigorous. That's how you derive Euler-Lagrange, I think. Uh, all right. And then you find right. Are you happier? Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> right. you, if you had the kinetic energy, if your problem was dynamic, you could also just add the kinetic energy there, right? And and use the same principle work theorem, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, and so then uh, what you can do, it's nice, because now if you know the force that you apply, you know the angle, right? Uh, and so again, here I'm going to be assuming small angle. So you can express, you can approximate, you t can tailor expand the sign, right? Uh, and if you do that, what you find is
Okay? And so this means that you know you either have the equilibria are either theta is zero or uh, basically theta is Can, can I ask something very quickly? In, yeah. in your last energy, you're keeping terms of two order square. Mm -hmm. are, are you not, when you're doing that expansion there, are not mm -hmm. taking terms higher order? In, in, in the uh, energy? In, in the force. When yes. you expand the sine of theta. Yeah. You have a cubic term there. Yeah. Here, you mean? Yes. Uh, so so it, it is as though you have a higher order term that you're not, you, 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 but here you, you're keeping terms to, to order square. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you could also, if you wanted, you could have a stuff like that, right? Yeah. Is that your question? Uh, exactly. So, so if you had a term that, that's of order yeah. four here, you would have a contribution there to that equation. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but here I'm, uh, yeah, I'm lazy, so I would just want the, the same. Okay, okay, that should not matter for the yeah, for yeah. the purpose of uh, okay. uh, yeah. But you, you, you could, you could. Okay, okay. Uh, you could, but it probably, you, yeah, you could. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. And so then that means that I have two equilibria, so I can I can draw uh, theta as a function of p, right? And I have. All right. All right. Uh, here it's P is one. Right. So I have two. I have a, you know, when I'm when P is smaller than one, I only have one mechanical equilibrium, and when P is larger than one, I have three. And you can actually convince yourself that theta is zero is actually an unstable equilibrium. Okay. Uh, and so uh, that, that that's nice. Uh, that means that you know if you if you have your truss here, you compress. If you if you have a tension force, so if you pull, it's going to be stable. It's going to remain straight. If you push, it's going to remain straight until you reach p is one. And at p is one, boom, you're going to buckle one way or the other. And so your force is going to uh, you know your force is going to increase, but much slower, right? Right. And that's why when you play with those here, or when you do those vibrations. Actually, uh, it's actually a very good uh, vibration damper, exactly because the force is having this form of plateau and drastic change right after buckling. Okay. Okay. Questions? Okay. And actually, the nice thing is, this is like the simplest model you can use for buckling. I, I, if you have, if you find a simpler one, I'm happy. I take it, but I don't think there is. But of course, you can make you can augment it. You can make the bar be a bit extensible. You can look at what happens if you have a bit of pre-angle, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, then they will become a bit uh, more complicated. But the essence really is, is, the, is the mechanic. Yes, there was a question in the back. Yes, I have a very simple question. Yeah. If you make a small angle approximation, yeah. I think you would impose some constraint on your value of your parameter p, for instance. P must be greater than 1 over 6 in order to have a real, real roots for your second degree equation for in theta. Your roots. Yeah, yeah. One, one of them depends on the parameter P. Yeah. They must be real roots, real numbers. Yes, yes. But if P is less than 1 over 6, you get Yeah, yeah. Then, then you, you get don't imaginary have, roots. Then you don't have real roots, yes, indeed. So then, then actually, the, the only the stable the solution, the only equilibrium But it is not a uh, constraint on the parameter P over there, on the, on the energy, potential energy over there. There is, and potential energy is P uh -huh. multiplied by 1 minus cosinus theta. Yeah. So for this to be true, P must be in such a way that you have only real roots. But if P elects the one of the six, you get complex roots. Mm -hmm. 
So your parameter P appears to be not a free parameter. I am correct in saying this. Mm. Or oh, this is rooted to your small angle approximation. So, yeah, maybe. I'm not sure what are the implications here, yeah, but uh, to me, like, th this equation is real, right? So, I mean, the, you, you need the, the root here to be real. So, even if you have complex root, uh, that, that, yeah, that you're interested about real roots there. So I, I don't think it's, uh, and I don't think you have any constraints on the value of p. It can be any real number uh, as far as I'm concerned. Except when p is large, then your approximation here probably uh, breaks down. Yeah. At, at some point, p became p over c, right? Say like it again? It, uh, that p is like p over c, the yeah. elastic energy of the. Yeah. Of ah, I forgot a, a c, no? Or? Ah, yes. Yes. You're right. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. There is the theta equals zero solution also. Yeah. So, so yeah. Even if it's 6p is smaller than c, there is the other solution which theta equals zero, so there is no problem, right? And this solution is only valid for p is larger than c, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so that, that's, uh, that, that's one thing you can do. And, you know, it's very basic, but actually if you want to describe your, your, your meta material with its buckling response, that's actually, I think, the, that's actually a very th good thing to do. You could also do like more continuous elastica and so on, but then it's much harder to see what happens in nonlinear regime. And so uh, that's why we, we, we like, those, uh, like those things. And actually, that's why, you know, you keep the mechanism, you keep it discrete, you just dress it with some elastic energy, essentially, right? So that's what's nice. You keep the, the trigonometry, the geometry of the mechanism, but you, you spice it up with some elastic energy, and, and it can tell you a lot of what's going on. Yeah. OK? Uh, perfect. Uh, I can show you what happens then in the first example of the movie that I showed. Uh, so this, this is uh, essentially the, the simplest form of buckling, which is called Euler buckling. So it's buckling of a, an object that actually, uh, that actually uh, loaded along its axis. Uh, but you can also, once this object is buckled, right, you can buckle left or right. But once it's buckled, what you can do is you know, push from the middle. And if you push from the middle, you will make it snap from one branch to the other branch. And this is called snap-through buckling, and that's actually also is a, a mechanism that's uh, very common, uh, uh, commonly used. And uh, what I want to do now is just go this extra step and uh, show you uh, what you can do, uh, what you can do to uh, to capture this extra force. Okay. So uh, to do this, what we do is we simply add a force now. Right, so I can add a force V, okay? Uh, and now uh, I'm gonna have the work of my longitudinal force, but I also have a work of the transverse force. Right? And uh, now, well, I can run it through the same, uh, uh, the same, um, machinery, essentially, and when I do that, what I find is, uh, all right, I'm probably making a sign mistake, all right, I can also just add an extra uh, force in here.
OK? Uh, and now what I can do when I do this, I can solve v of theta, right? So I can really express v as a function of theta, so the, the transverse force as a function of uh, uh, the angle, right? And when I do this, what I find v as a function of theta, I find a non-monotonic curve, right? Right? Uh, only if, if p, so I find that this is when p is larger than c, and if p is less than c, I find a monotonic curve, right? And so, which means that it exactly means that. That means that when I'm buckled, you know, if I push on the side, I will make it snap from one side to the other. Uh, and in doing so, I will get a kind of non-monotonic curve. That's also an interesting building block for mechanical functionality because you get something that can be uh, bistable, for instance. Okay? And that's, that's something that you have in origami, for instance, and, and so on and so forth. Okay? Yes? Is that the force or the potential? Uh, v here, I wrote the force. Transverse oh, V force. is the force, okay. Somehow. V is the transverse force, yes. So this is really a, uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. And so this is, you know, buck Euler buckling is really what happens when you have, a, you know, the first initial buckling. And then snap through buckling is really what happens when you go from one side to the other. Uh, and essentially that's, uh, these are I think, the, most, the two most basic uh, mechanisms you can use when you design a mechanical metamaterial. Yeah. Does it make sense? Okay. Okay, so uh, now I'll show you a slightly more elaborate version of this one, right? Uh, which is, yeah? When you solve, okay. when you solve view of uh, theta, what is exactly the, the meaning of the maximum and the minimum there? Here and here, you mean? Mm -hmm. So that means that if you would load this, uh, if, if uh, you impose a displacement, at some point you need less force to push more, right? Uh, yeah, less force, so that's a bit of weird uh, negative, if you wish, like here you have a negative uh, stiffness, right? Okay. Yeah. If you impose the force or if you vibrate, then the thing is just gonna jump there, right, or back. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, and so basically, this kind of mechanism allows you to, you know, go beyond linear response, linear elasticity, and that's potentially interesting as a, a mechanical feature. Uh, this is again the same geometry I showed you before, with the two sides of the holes, and what it's it's actually realizing a slightly more uh, advanced version of this, right? And the interesting thing here is that this object, because it has these two sides of holes, uh, will respond differently whether you, you, you compress it from the top or from the bottom, uh, f from, the, from the top or from the side. Uh, and, uh, and basically, uh, this leads, this is uh, an example of, of uh, uh, an example. So if you pre-confine it on the side, you see that the hole will change side, will change shape, go from, you polarize the hole uh, vertically before uh, uh, when through the confinement, and then when you apply, you see that the hole will, the central hole will, will here actually uh, uh, become uh, horizontal. If you do the same with a bit more confinement, uh, you see that this transition would actually be uh, come together with this kind of force curve here that is a Negative. So here the equivalent is really when p is less than c, and here the equivalent would be when p is a bit more than c. Uh, and so you see this is what happens here. The force is monotonic. Your whole central hole go from vertical to horizontal. If you do it a bit more, the transition is a bit more sudden, and it, it comes with a force, a stiffness that's here uh, negative. And here, uh, if you actually, uh, confine even more, you see that the transition is very abrupt and it jumps, right? And, uh, 
and then that makes a huge hysteresis loop. So that's kind of a, here the interesting thing was that you can program the amount of hysteresis by the amount of confinement. This last phase here, you cannot describe by this simple model, but you can do it by adding an energy scale, by adding a spring and by exerting the force through the spring. And that's how you can actually, if you add this degree of freedom, then you can capture this uh, hysteresis there. Okay. Um, maybe if we have a bit of time. Yeah. What, what prevents you from doing this with higher order modes? In other words, you don't just, you, you could work, you're working with a bifurcation, yep. but you could have a higher order bifurcation that splits into three or four or five different uh, buckles, yep. right? Yep. Just by stabilizing the lower order modes. Yep. And then you could have you know, transitions from arbitrary yep. states. Yeah, I agree. So I guess if I may reformulate your question, uh, if you have, let's say, a structure that's more a continuous beam, right? Like, like this, would, you know, a fiber that would be you know, doing this, right? In principle, this is the first mode, but you also have the second mode, the third mode, and so on and so forth. Is that what yeah. you're... Yeah, yeah, exactly. And if you stabilize uh, the first and second, then you're yeah. often running with higher order bifurcations. Yeah, uh, the, the, the catch <laughs> is that then it starts to look like this. So you will have a first mode, and then a second mode, and then a third mode. It will start to look a bit like a Christmas tree. But the thing is, it's hard to access this bifurcation and, and not having you know, undergone the buckling in this bone, right? No, uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, or maybe sometimes you can bring this node you know, close to this yes, one. Yes, and, yeah. and then you have multiple yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. St stable lines coming from yeah. the same bifurcation. Yeah, or, or they are very close to one another or very closely degenerate. I guess there's a point where they are absolutely degenerate, right? Uh, yes. Uh, you, you can do that, it's just a bit harder because this really starts to become sensitive on you know, small imperfections and so on. But I think in principle you can do that, yeah. yeah. I, actually, the, yeah. actually, for instance, one example I know of we start to work on is this uh, Kirigami strip where you have you know, this Kirigami unit cell, right? And this one can buckle uh, like this or like this. Oh. So this is my Kirigami uh, unit cell, right? right? And I think this is an example where they are almost degenerate or maybe even absolutely degenerate there, the Kirigami. If you make a Kirigami sheet based on this, so you, know, you make a, a cut, right? Actually, in practice, what happens is that you, you don't really control which modes you get. You get a mixture of modes, right? So often, I think, when you have bifurcations that have close energy, what you end up with a large system is a mixture of modes. Uh, and then you have to find a trick to select one rather than the other, right? And what, n now we're currently using strain rate to select one or the other, but I think there's many tricks you could play, right, to, to, to select one or the other. Yeah. Yeah, but so if you have a buckling beam, Yep. And if you put lateral constraints on the right positions and then other pushing things, you have what you want, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why I think there's some people who have done, you know, they, they have a buckling beam in a channel, right? And then the channel somehow prevents the, you know, the first mode is, is triggered, but then the channel prevents the first mode to go further. So then it swaps into the second mode and so on and so forth. So I think you have a, yeah. All right. Um, okay. I'm a, uh, I'm trying to think. No, maybe I have the time. Okay. I'll, uh... So what I can quickly show you is uh, how you can go beyond this kind of 
for me this stress and try to keep more of the mechanism, right? So imagine we take uh, the, the mechanism that kind of approximates uh, this metamaterial here, right? So if the holes are two sizes, then you can think of, you can, the mechanism describes it is a, 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 a rectangle that hinge, right? And then here what you can do is describe the size of this mechanism, right? As a function of, for, for instance, this uh, internal angle here, theta. You can use, you know, to, you can parameterize your system. So what you find if you do that is that you have x is 2a sine theta plus 2b cosine theta, and y is 2b sine theta plus 2a uh, cosine theta, right? So if a equals to b, so if you're into the squares, uh, then what you find is actually that x and b, x and y, are uh, linearly related, right? Which means you come back to your purely oxetic material that changes the, water, the horizontal size exactly proportional to the uh, to the uh, vertical size, vertical size, right? If you are, if a is different than b, what you can show, I don't have the time to do the derivation, but you can show that a and b are uh, related like this. Right? So you can show that A and B have a, this relation. And this is actually the equation of an ellipse. Right? And so actually, when theta goes between 0 and pi over 2, uh, what you have is a quarter, uh, a half of an, a quarter of an ellipse, like this, right? So, which means, which explains what I said, right? If you, you have this mechanism that has kind of this non-monotonic curve. So, if you compress the mechanism from the top, it will tend to become uh, uh, flatter. So, it, uh, because the y becomes smaller, but if you compress from the sides, it will become taller because, uh, because typically y tends to uh, uh, increase. Okay and uh, skinnier because x decreases in those things. okay and so now what's interesting about what's interesting about uh, dressing this mechanism is that if you imagine that you have springs here so i dress my mechanism i add little springs here <laughs> so i add springs but i, I have the springs but the rest length of the spring will be zero, right? And so here I have a, a box. I have a box that's connected to my mechanism through some springs of rest length zero. And if I do that, I have a graphical interpretation for my elastic energy because my elastic energy would be then um, would be x minus x box one half plus one half y minus x box, right? Okay, which is nice because that means that if I have my box here, so here I have my 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 box size, let's say, is here. Uh, I can interpret, I can graphically represent my elastic energy by just drawing a circle, and the radius of the circle would have the square root of the energy, OK? Which means that I can analyze my mechanics by just by looking at trajectories of this point and looking at how the ray, the circle changes over time, OK? Orantan, please, can yep. you come back in this figure of x and y? I really, yep. I, I, I got lost in this okay. description that you, had, that you did. Yeah. How should I read it? Should I understand that? Uh, this is the this is the, the um, when you tr start to, comp to compress the system. This is the how the system in X and Y is gonna draw in the, sp the phase space. Yes, this is really the so if I'm here, uh, I'm gonna be uh, my 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 rectangles are gonna be like this, right? 
And if I'm here, my rectangles are going to be like this. Right? And, and when I fold or unfold, I, can, I will follow that curve. Right? Okay. Thank you. Um, and so now I have a few different scenarios. So in those experiments that we're doing, uh, you know, I have x and y. And then what we do is we pre-confine, right? So we, we select an x box, and then we do a vertical confinement. So we pre-confine, and then we smoosh from the top. That means that my energy, I can just know by looking at the radius of the circle. So what I can do is then look at the energy versus the size of my box YB. And what will happen here is that uh, I will have a large cycle, a large circle when I'm far up. My circle will become a bit smaller when I get close to the ellipse, and then it will become big again. So my energy will just have a single minimum. Right? Now I can do this also here. And you see here what will happen is that my energy, I will cross that curve twice, so my energy will twice go to zero. Is this given that you are constraining x, right? Yeah, you constrain x box here, and you, you go along that line. Right. That's exactly those experiments, right? And so when you do this, what you will see is that your energy would actually do this, right? Yeah? So uh, the box contains multiple unit cells, right? And this diagram you uh, draw is for one unit cell. Yeah, it, are yeah, you yeah. assuming that all of the unit cells do the same yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, okay. again, this is for the second part of the lecture where we look at uh, you know, variations in space. Okay. Now we just have a single building. We assume that uh, the system is small enough that only, uh, you know, the, I see, they all yeah. do the same. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a uh, not very correct assumption, but so far that's it. Uh, yeah? I'm still confused um, by Carolina's question. So if I take your x, which is the yeah. extent of the, is that what we're, yeah. we're saying? Yeah, x of the. X. Okay, so the thing is flat like this. Yeah. X is maximal. Yeah. It's monotonic when it goes to here. No, it's not. No, I don't, I don't get why it's not. It, it, it's, uh, it, it just keeps decreasing. No, because here you see that you. Ah, what know, these, these corners here, <laughs> they go out, right, in, right? So they're, they're really non-monotonic. Right? What is X? And, oh, no, I see, the extent. Really here, uh -huh. the extent, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, OK, yeah, so, so yeah. OK, but, I get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's really what the shape of that ellipse tells you. Right? OK, and then very quickly again, the circle. So the circle, so if you, if you make a very gross assumption that your springs have a zero rest length, Energy just looks like this, right? And so uh, you see that this is the equation of a circle, yeah, of center x b y b, yeah, right. And so that means that if you draw those ellipses, uh, if you draw, you know, where your box is here, uh, you you draw the ad, you know the, the smallest circle that's adjacent, or touching the the, the, yeah. the curve that tells you your your amount of elastic energy. And then when and they cut through? When you cut through, you see that here you, you start with a big radius, you get close, you have a smaller radius, and then and then you go again, you have a bigger radius. So that's why the energy here as I go down yeah. uh, Good. does this. And then the bottom? In the bottom when I cross. But how does that happen? When, how do you cross? If you confine more, if you confine more, so your your X B is a bit smaller, you cross. And that means that here there's two points where my energy goes to zero. Okay. Yeah. So that's when I become uh, non-monotonic. So yeah. In the first case, is it a confined or stretched? It looks like it's stretched, uh, right? It doesn't really matter so long. It doesn't really matter, I guess. Uh, so long as you're, so long as you're on the right of this ellipse. So, so the change. when you print this thing, um, it is somewhere on that uh, ellipse, right? The way you. So, so the when you just print it as a stress-free material, yeah, and then it is on one point on the ellipse, right? Yeah, exactly. So uh, uh, when you print it, you print it here, 
because yeah. it's theta is pi over four. Right. How how do you confine to make x bigger than that? Uh, here we we had uh, you know laser cut clamps and glue some things and yeah. That was so bad. it's stretch, right? Uh, here it was mostly compressed, but you could also have stretched it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, in the, I guess in the model here, the way I illustrated it by was by stretching, right? Okay. But in reality, whenever you compress, you will always be in that regime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, and yeah. so I'm not sure I understood why you wrote the energy this way. So I can understand if you say, okay, it's an expansion about x and uh, yeah. y, but then I would expect also like mixed terms. Uh, well, but that's that's the choice I made for how I dress my mechanism. Here, my 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 premise was let's be as lazy as possible but, and have but the simplest the expression as possible. But this okay. is the distance from the um, is the distance from the lap frame or the distance from the curve, which like the distance from the floppy curve. Uh, the distance from the floppy curve is the square root of your energy. Yeah. Okay. Because if I'm away from the floppy curve, my 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 springs are stretched a bit. All right. Uh, I'm, uh, there's also an interesting, the, the regime that you have on the right, I don't have time to discuss, but I just mentioned it because I know that Itai likes differential geometry. Uh, there's just an interesting uh, bifurcation that occurs, a transcritical bifurcation that unfolds exactly when the circle has the same curvature of the ellipse. And you can actually trace the, all the positions where this happens, which is the involute of the ellipse. Right? Yeah. But I don't want to discuss that more, just uh, because I know you like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, more, it's, it's described in detail in the paper if you're, if you're interested. Okay? So that, that closes, I think, the discussion of you know, examples of nonlinear mechanics uh, through these very basic dressed uh, mechanisms. Right? Uh, and. Uh, well, I think that's interesting, and I think you could potentially uh, follow uh, the, the, the idea of uh, Itai and say, hey, uh, let's try to have more bifurcations and see what happens. And, uh, uh, but so to me, that's kind of the simplest way you can think of bifurcations and, and instabilities in those systems, and so that's, that's, that's I think, quite nice. Yeah. So, uh, so that's it for now. Um, and so now I'll quickly discuss what happens beyond the linear response. In the rest, uh, I want to discuss what happens beyond the unit cell, all right? Uh, we might want to take a little break, five minutes break maybe. Uh, I just want to show you a, a teaser video. Uh, this is a large rotating square mechanism, and if you point it there, it's a bit like what happens with the foot, you see uh, that essentially what you have uh, is a spatial decay of the mechanism there. And uh, what I want to discuss is how we can actually predict the decay and understand that decay uh, and, um, and, and uh, you know, how then we take this simple mechanistic model to make them spatially extended and, and understand this, this decay uh, by dressing our mechanism once more with an additional energy scale and this is the ratio between the pure bending energy scale and extra energy scale that will tell us that decay length. Uh, but five minutes break before that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like something like this. Yeah, you could do that. Can you do like a different two movements but not the same energy level? Yeah, so you you could do that. Yes. Yeah. So then, can you have like front, uh, like you have something like this? Uh, yeah. So if you want to do that, 
you have, uh, I don't know if you can do that with that simple scenario. Like, like, uh, like this, that none, uh, of the, none of the minimum touch zero. Yeah, but I don't know if you can do that with such a simple curve. Uh, you perhaps have to make the curve a bit more complicated, right? Because, but if you if you make a curved curve, right, you could do a, right something yeah. like this, right? Or you know, so if, if you, you know, if you if you don't compress only in one direction but have a slightly more advanced yes, sequence, yes, you can do that. Uh, yeah. Then can you have like, can you see like the kind of like fronts that go from one state to the other? And propagating. Well, if you want a front that propagates, you need to make it specially extended. I will discuss that in fact after. <laughs> yeah, I was just actually thinking. So, the, what are the implications of what you discussed? Does it doesn't mean that there's a, a large area with zero energy, basically? Yeah, so what happens is that you have a. a, a I had to remember because it's been a long time, <laughs> but what happens is that the, 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 the second derivative of your energy with respect to your position will vanish. And typically, that means that you will have a bifurcation and instability. Right? So what happens, so what, what happens is that, I mean, if, you, if you're here, you know, the, the, the circle that's a more, you know, the, the circle will follow this path. Mm -hmm. But if you're here, you know, when you compress, the circle will actually go left, right? So you will trigger the other way. And in the middle, you have, a, you know, a few bifurcations here. That kind of uh, that kind of uh, you know, precisely determine the scenario from which uh, that you know that defines how you go from you know going from there to there, right? I guess, yeah. Uh, and so so essentially, uh, you know, if you track the angle as a function of y b, right? Uh, so the angle uh, here goes down, right? So when you compress y b, right? So here the angle you start from uh, let's say. Uh, by over four, and you do this, right? But at the same time, at some point, you will do this, and then this, and at some point, then you will do this. When you, you know, the more you're confining, right? The, the more you're confining, you know, and, and this here defines when actually this verification here unfolds, essentially. Yeah. In which paper? This is the PRL, the first paper. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's not necessarily uh, you need. I think this kind of for me that stress is much more generic. Like this is just a special case, right? But yeah. I think it's useful sometimes to think it's about geometry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Did you make experiments with um, L button? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, Another experiment. Mm -hmm. In the past? Yeah, in the past we did that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah for, for, because I, 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 only, yeah. I only know the, the, the circle uh, lattice that you make, but I, I, I didn't know that you. Yeah, we did a bit of, of buckling as well. Yeah, yeah, mostly on beams. On beam buckling, but now we you know, now we use buckling. Uh, we use buckling a lot in fact these days. So yeah. What if you if you use uh, a continuum model for 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 this kind of improvement of the? You can. Uh, no, I mean, uh, yeah, you I can, mean, you can also. Yeah. I mean, I expect that the result is gonna be similar, but. Uh, yeah, you can do that as well. Yeah. But I mean. Uh, I, I was thinking it in the long in your uh, In that case. Yeah, we do that. The, uh, the actually, the that's the part of the lecture afterwards. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, because maybe yeah. in the long linear limits, this, yeah. this method is, yeah. is inception. Uh, well, yes, know. yes, yeah. No, that's, that's uh, in the non linear limit, yes, indeed, you. No, no, you can. You can uh, I'll show you a way in which you can do that. Or, or later. Uh, Maybe 
Yeah, yeah, I think they had started before, it seems to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, so what do you think happens? Why is this rotate? Why why are these rotations not uniform? Right. So I told you the mechanism by. Why not rotating energy? Yeah. Then if you need to compress the entire uh, the entire structure, then you have yeah. a lot of this energy, so you can also compress some of the elements locally. Yeah. So I repeat uh, the argument of Ben is that you know. If you have uh, 25 by 25 squares here, you have, I don't know, a few hundred torsional hinges. And so the, gr the bigger your system gets, the somehow the, the more energy it costs. And so somehow the system finds a way to do, th do things that are energetically cheaper. So it means like, so to lowest order, these, these squares, neighboring squares just rotate. But then at some point, even though it's not been designed for that, it's perhaps preferential to actually, you know, uh, rotate in the same direction, or even stretch a little bit, right? And actually, what, what we'll do is, I will just discuss that if you add, you, you, there's multiple ways you could do that, but if you just add an energy scale that describes, for instance, the, not counter rotations only, but the rotations uh, that are uh, the, the, in the same direction, then actually that kind of sufficiently, uh, that's sufficient to explain the decay, and this decay length is exactly the ratio between these two energy scales, right? So what you can do to do this, imagine I have a chain here that describes, I, I push from here, that, that kind of describes a, a column uh, of the squares, right? Uh, and so uh, each are parameterized by an angle, theta one, theta two, theta three, theta four, and so on, right? So uh, I would have then, one way in which you can describe this is describe the energy. So you have a bending energy here that would describe the sum of uh, counter rotations, right? So when theta one and theta two move uh, in the same direction, uh, move counterclockwise, uh, the energy grows, it grows like this. But then you also can, for instance, have an extra shear energy. I put here a coefficient one for the torsional because it's, it's, it, uh, I'm lazy. Uh, but you can also do it for the shear. You have a different coefficient. You have a different energy scale. Uh, but here, the counter rotation is described by a minus sign. OK, so this is describes the energy that it costs to rotate like this. And this one, the energy that it costs to rotate like this. OK? OK? And uh, again, you can also uh, describe the work of the force that's going down. And uh, the work is P sinus of theta zero, which you can approximate linearize if you are only interested in linear response at first, right? Okay? Anton, just to be yeah. clear, uh, the, this, this is squares that you are drawing and then the angle, yeah. The the angle is supposed you are supposing when the this, this those squares are being rotated in respect to the y angle, right? Then I have to uh, yes. So I mean the y x. Here, yes. Yes. So here uh, again, I'm maybe not super rigorous, but let's assume that these squares cannot move; they're just pinned to the column. Oh, okay. Basically, you theta or any par any parameter any way to parameterize their rotation uh, would do, right? Uh, Okay. Okay. Then again, you can apply, you know, principal work theorem of Euler Lagrange, right? Uh, based on those. Uh, and so, if I write my Lagrangian, it's you know, E bending plus E shear plus work, right? And then applying this earlier Lagrange theorem is you have to minimize for every uh, single theta i, for every single degree of freedom, right? And uh, when you do this, what you find is 
is this. Which is a nice and zero, right? Which is a nice discrete set of discrete equations, right? That solve algebraic equation that defines your uh, your, your your dynamics, okay? And so that's nice. Uh, you can you can also solve it. Even it's a linear set of ODEs, so you can solve it if you want. Yeah, uh, quick question. The convention you choose is that uh, the even and the odd squares have opposite. Uh, Positive direction for theta. Is that uh, right? No, 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 no. Here I, I kept the same. The same, but yeah. then um, bending is the the sum. Yes. Bending is supposed to be the softer. It's it's this, right? Yeah. I have to. I, I wrote this, but the plane. But maybe I made a mistake. So let's see. <laughs> uh, so I have two subsequent squares, right? And let's say this guy rotates, and this guy rotates. This is bending, right? And so, uh, you know, theta i here would be positive, and theta i here would be, i plus one here would be negative, right? This is what yes. happens when that. And so you have an energy cost. Uh, yeah, then E bending will be zero, right? Yeah, let, let's, let's do the shear bending. So if you have the shear bending, it's uh, the opposite. So you have here, they both rotate. In the same direction. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, so when when these two are equal, indeed I shear bend. Uh, so it might be that I made a mistake, indeed. Right, I think. I'm not sure. It's been a long time, but okay. Yes. Okay. Thanks. I hope. I'm not entirely sure, but uh, well, let's let's assume um, let's assume this is correct. Uh, and uh, and so now the convention is that clockwise is positive angles and and counterclockwise is negative angles. Okay. Uh, if you, what's interesting perhaps is to look at the continuum limit. So we, we're interested in about the typical decay length, so the decay of this anti-ferromagnetic order. So there we want to go, we, we want to take, we want to assume that things counter-rotate and look at, the, you know, how this counter-rotation decays in space. So here what we do is we introduce a staggered, Variable, which is, I guess, what we started from. <laughs> uh, so where we have phi is uh, just, you know, we take a different conven convention for the, for the one that are ranked in the odd and the one that are ranked in the even. And so what we find if we do this is the equation we had uh, before Xiaoming corrected me. Okay plus alpha, okay, plus this one is going to have a minus now, okay? And now that's nice because this field is uh, slowly varying in space, right? And so since this field, you know, so phi uh, plus minus one is actually uh, quite close to phi of i plus one, right? So that means that uh, I can actually approximate this by a continuum. So I can approximate this by, uh, I can Taylor expand phi by, uh, by derivative, spatial derivative of it, okay? And now that what I can do is I can plug this Taylor expansion in here, right? And so what I find when I do this uh, is uh, then zero equals um, then four phi plus 
plus spatial derivative of phi, uh, second spatial derivative of phi plus alpha uh, minus alpha. Okay, and so what I have at the end uh, is uh, zero is four phi uh, plus alpha minus one. Okay, uh, minus alpha minus one. Okay, which is good. Yeah. Um, I think in the Taylor expansion, uh, uh -huh. you miss a um, length dimension because the first term. Uh, no dimension and second is uh, one, one per length. Well, uh, one over length. Mm -hmm. So. One over. Yeah, be, because the, 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 the derivative. You, you're derivating in the second term, so you need a, a length in. A length. A length. Ah, yeah, I take one. Ah, okay. But you're right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I make enough mistakes when I write <laughs> few numbers, but yes, you're right, yes. Uh, yes, so I'm, I'm working in unit one, yeah. Okay, so this is good. This is an equation that we all like and, and, and solve it because this admits exponential solutions, exponential decay, exponentially decaying solutions, right? If, if so, if I write it like this, if this is, is this prefactor is bigger than zero, then this is admitting uh, solutions of this form. Phi is exponential plus or minus um, uh, x divided by lambda, where lambda is a characteristic length scale that is here, the square root of this, right? Which means that actually this decay, this, this, uh, this like kind of arguments predict that this decay is exponential, okay? Uh, which is actually what we see in the lab if we do the measurements, right? Uh, and you see that the, the length scale, lambda, is actually given by alpha, and alpha tells you basically the ratio between your shear energy and your bending energy. So if it costs you a lot of energy to shear, you're gonna have a longer decay. And, if, and, and, uh, and you know, we work very hard to make uh, shear very expensive in comparison to bending. So in, in principle, when, we, when we're happy with our, our you know, printing, or it's when alpha is very large, because then it costs much less to bend than to shear. Okay? And, and, uh, but, but you know, ultimately, you, you know, this, even when we do best effort with your best printing method, you always have a finite thickness, and so it's always a ligament here that will always have some you know, some finite energy. It's never going to be infinite to actually shear a little bit. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. You're solving the problem for a one-dimensional string. Does yeah. it matter if you generalize it for two dimensions? And uh, if so, there's any hope to it? Yeah. So actually, that's that's uh, what I want to show next. So thanks for the transition. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, what we did in that earlier paper was to uh, focus on the linear response of one of these strips, and the idea was to have actually. Uh, uh, bending and, and shear, and you could show that. What we did, to, we collaborated actually uh, with uh, Zeb Rockling and his postdoc, Michael Tchaikovsky, and they actually were inspired by the picture before, where they say, hey, in fact, in fact, this thing, if you look carefully at the 2D, okay, there's an exponential decay, but what you actually see when you pay closely is that uh, this object, um, the, the, the form, if you zoom in on each point, it seems like this object uh, only, uh, you know, if you draw a line at the center of the squares, the lines always remain perpendicular to one another, right? So at the end of the day, this doesn't shear too much. They just have dilations and, and chains of dilations, but there, it seems like, it looks like uh, there's not so much shear. So the, the squares, you know, if you make up a, a grid with the, 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 sh the, the squares, maybe it does this, but it doesn't really, does, it doesn't really shear, right? And so the, the, the kind of what they proposed is that if you want to describe the mechanics of this object, maybe what you can do is only describe the dilation. So this, this form here describes the, the amount of dilation that you have and the gradient of the dilation, right? And, 
And if you do that, actually, this is uh, this grid that you can push into fully into the nonlinear regime. And that doesn't do such a bad job at describing the deformation here just by having those two terms, dilation and gradient of dilation. Of course, the, you know, there's a ratio of length scale. And of course, the gradient of dilation ultimately comes from the fact that your squares can shear. So microscopically, it's the same. But, but you can construct uh, an effective theory of elasticity that's nice because it's a scalar theory. You know? uh, so usually, elasticity is nasty because it's tensorial. But if you only have to think about uh, dilations and gradients of dilations, you have a scalar elastic theory, which is sweet. That's why you can actually push it into the nonlinear regime. How, how alpha is defined there? Then is it you, you take a square in this, and uh, then you take a difference against uh, compared to the square? Uh, so here, I think what they did was to take a little grid here and de define you know this alpha as a you know as a level of dilation of the, of the square okay. compared to the to the relaxed square. Yeah. Uh, yes. And actually, what's also nice is that you know when you have a, a map that preserves angles, so where you don't have shear, this actually uh, uh, it's it's actually uh, called a conformal transformation, a conformal map. Uh, and uh, that has mathematically, mathematically, that's what it means. You have a, a map that has that has no shear, so that conserves angles, right? And and on top of that, what they what Michael and, and Zeb and us experimentally uh, numerically showed. Uh, is that actually, since you have these conformal maps, you can use some of the properties of the conformal maps. And, and one example that we could show is that, for instance, if you know the, the deformations at the boundaries, you can predict uh, the deformations inside uh, just by using uh, conformal maps. Okay? But the physics is the same. The physics is, you know, it, it will cost you a lot to actually, uh, uh, or actually this, this kind of uh, loading condition, you have like three-point bending, uh, is incompatible with pure homogeneous deformation. So you will have to have gradients of dilations, right? And, and so the idea is that whenever you do something real, you will have to, to, uh, to, to, to go to, you know, be, what's beyond the mechanism is actually to describe these distortions or these deviations from the pure mechanism. And this is, there's more than one way of doing it. This is one way that's perhaps quite promising because you can push it into the nonlinear regime because you can construct a scalar field theory for elasticity. You can also yeah. play with uh, with um, disordered uh, metamaterials uh, because, for example, I was thinking when you show that there is this exponential decay, mm -hmm. um, that it's, for example, for for granular media, you would expect a different decay mm -hmm. depending on the regime. Should could you imagine that that is it do if you mm -hmm. if you introduce disorder in your yeah. Yeah, I think what you could do then is have a bit of disorder in your coefficients, right? And then you have like a partial differential equation or integral that has some disordered you know, prefactors. And then I'm sure you can have a lot of fun with that, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, you could also have a bit of disorder in your maybe a dilation angle, the alpha, but there, there I'm not sure, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, I, I'm wondering uh, into thinking of Concrete physical example. If you take your function m alpha, yeah. like alpha square, the user harmonic strength, mm -hmm. m tag, m two alpha constant. Mm -hmm. uh, what physical this would describe if it, if it has some physical meaning? Uh, it is a, like a, a, a massive field in uh, two dimensions. It could uh, be able to. Yeah. One would be able to make a calculation, explicit mm. calculation with that. Alpha is your other parameter. So alpha, you know, you solve for alpha. No, I, I think the function mi alpha yeah. equals to alpha square. And I'm only yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That, That's actually, I think, the approximation we use. So that, that's, I mean, is, that, that, is there anything special to take it this, uh, like well, alpha you, square? You assume it's harmonic, so that's yes. actually the, the simplest. Uh, uh, yes, if you assume the, the function, the overall factor and the gradient of alpha constant. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what, what, what that, would you mean that? That's what, that's what we do, in fact. Here it's constant plus a small correction in alpha. Right? And so that, that, that's basically what, what we solve for, for that case. Physically, what would you describe it as a uh, uh, So th th this coefficient actually, 
we calibrated, I calibrated using numerical simulations of a unit cell. Uh, uh, and so to, to estimate those, what I needed is to compress the unit cell, shear the unit cell, uh, and, and basically you can get this M tilde. So here, here the M you get from when you compress your unit cell, and typically is quadratic in alpha. And this is uh, also, uh, I think, constant with the correction in alpha. And you can get that when you shear your unit cell and measure the stiffness. Of so it would be like to take as a toy example to do calculations with the, with the energy function. No? We will yes, not get yeah, any problem yeah, to, yeah. to consider that yeah. as a toy problem, for instance. It would just test to make calculations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so here, what we what we did is to estimate this from you know the microscopics using numerics, but you could also do have a, like more like a ginsburg lando argument where you just look the take the leading order, and, and it seems like if I understand correctly, that's what okay. you're proposing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. there, there is another question here. Um, so the conformal mapping uh, is it like it's a approximation for small deformations or it's exact? No, no, it doesn't ha it doesn't need to be small deformations. Okay, for uh, large deformations, it remain, it continues to be yeah. conformal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so long as you're, so it can be. Yeah, it is purely valid for large deformations. So long as you're, so long as you're not, uh, uh, so long as you're not. Uh, uh, no, no, it, it, it is valid. It's just like at the end you get a nasty nonlinear PD, so you can hardly solve it analytically, but you can solve it numerically, right? Okay, all right. So that's what we did so far. Uh, we went beyond the linear response, beyond the uh, we went beyond the unit cell, and beyond the linear response. But and now I kind of showed you that with conformal limits you can kind of combine the two, be both nonlinear and beyond the unit cell. Now I want to show you another example where we actually can do that, uh, and that's actually uh, 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 and in that case what you get is nonlinear waves, solitons, and those solitons actually uh, will have a width that is exactly given by uh, that characteristic length scale that we had estimated here. So this is work actually uh, led by uh, Xiaofei, who's uh, you know, sitting in the front here. Uh, and this is a specific case of a, a nonlinear object. So here, what we uh, use is uh, this uh, rotating square mechanism again. And uh, when you compress it, you see that you can buckle left or right. And so uh, that's very similar to this von Mises truss that actually uh, I showed you at the beginning, the one that was buckling left or right. Uh, and uh, what you can do is get frustrate that mechanism, and if you frustrate that mechanism, you get solitons. Uh, and um, and uh, well, there's no additional story on top of that, uh, but now I just want to focus on maybe what's mo closely, most closely connected to the course, uh, which is uh, you know this idea of Soliton. So imagine you want to do an experiment. You know, we have lots of fancy compression machines, but actually we can also do low-tech things just using Ziploc bags uh, and a vacuum pump. And this is what you can do, right? And you see that when you do that, the, the vacuum, the Ziploc bag compresses, does a nice uniform compression. And uh, what you see is that when you have an even, an odd number of squares, uh, you frustrate the anti-ferromagnetic order. Okay, and so you see that here everything tends to counter rotate, uh, except here, right, where the square here didn't rotate, uh, just because the system, when it's odd, cannot accommodate uh, this entry fragment everywhere. It has to be, it has to be frustrated somewhere, right? Um, if and so if you track, uh, if you track the deformations here angles, you see that indeed you have a uh, unit that is not buckled. And actually, if you look at the squares, the very constructive square here, you see that they have, a, they have been sheared quite a bit, right? Uh, on the other hand, if you use now an even number of squares, there's no problem. You can accommodate anti-ferromagnetic order everywhere, right? And, uh, and that's nice. You can make it odd with a slightly, for different number, 17 instead of 15. Then you get also a domain wall here, right? Uh, and uh, and you can also make it even with more, and then you see that there's no problem again, right? So I guess the, the question I want to address, or the way I want to link that, is to show like how you can back up this model to accommodate, to combine this model with this von Mises trust model that we had at the beginning. Um, just quickly to show you, 
uh, which, what we did also is to show that this frustration that you can get because of this parity uh, problem, you can actually extend it to, to 2D with tori. And there, uh, instead of uh, having a, a one node where the deformations vanish, you have lines. Uh, and you can play with the geometry. You can, you can get the line you want by controlling the parity on the, the toroidal or poloidal axis of your torus. Okay? Good. And so how do we do this? How do we expand this? Uh, well, it's actually, once we've written everything, it's actually not too difficult. <laughs> what the vacuum bag does is that it pushes everywhere with a constant force here. Right? So the work of this force that you apply on the vacuum bag with the vacuum bag is actually just just that, right? So you assume that the force is the same everywhere, right? Okay? And so uh, now the only thing that you do is actually to add this work of the force here, right? And so then what you get is P sine theta, right? Which you can also approximate by theta minus theta cube over six, right? Which in your staggered variables is the same. Okay, which in your partial differential equation is the same. Okay, and so now instead of this linear PDE that admits exponential solutions, you have an equation that is so called. This is really a phi to the fourth uh, equation. And from the literature, you know that this phi to the fourth admits solution of the form arctangent of x minus x zero over lambda, where lambda is your characteristic length scale. OK? Uh, and so that's, that's exactly how you can. Uh, basically generalize, combine here, the, the source of nonlinearity in that very specific case is purely the, the work of the force, so the fact that you confine it everywhere, and that's really what adds this kind of, uh, yeah, by stability. That means that, uh, that means that when you have a soliton, uh, you will have a domain rule. So if I draw phi of x as a function, uh, phi as a function of x, I will have a, you know, a one value of phi, or actually, that goes to, Know, positive value to negative value. So that means I have a domain wall between you know, one value of my other parameter to the other value of the other parameter. OK? Here, there's a little bit of a joke because, uh, because, because you have an odd number of, uh, because you have an odd number of squares, actually, there's no way in which you can define a consistent, consistently your other parameter over the whole loop. And therefore, the only thing you can do is to, uh, uh, you can actually, uh, in, that, in that variable, what you can show is that the elasticity of that object is actually very similar to the elasticity of a Mobius strip, uh, which is non-orientable. <laughs> uh, and uh, what, what we show actually, what uh, Denis Bartolo and David Carpentier had shown before is that the elasticity of a Mobius strip uh, is, can be described by this equation plus a topological, topological constraints that makes that this field has to vanish uh, somewhere. So instead of having a full soliton, basically what you end up is having two half kings here that have to vanish at the point, point S star, right? right? Uh, and so, but, but that's, that's just the, the, because of the topological constraints that come from this non-orientability that you have here, okay? But otherwise, the size of this kink, the, the width of this kink is actually given uh, also by the same characteristic length scale that it was previously. You, you know, uh, you, you, you cannot counter-rotate everywhere, so you have to accommodate some gradients by virtue of the topology, and the, the characteristic size over which you do that is given uh, by your uh, alpha. Oh, actually, not, not only alpha, but also a bit of the p, because you see that here, the p also come in, comes in at the linear level. Yeah. Could you explain yeah. again with the chain why 
it cannot fully close here. So why does it have to go for zero as well? Ah, uh, well, if I have a, you know, if I have an odd number of squares, I rotate, I counter rotate, I rotate, I counter rotate. But here, does it have any assumption about the uh, number of squares? No, because here I didn't, I didn't treat any of the boundary conditions. So here I assume like an infinite medium. Right? Okay, but you still yeah. got that the that it passes for zero, didn't you? No, I only get the passage through. Ah, uh, if, if I'm if I'm here on a, you know, on a ring, then I will have to go through zero if my ring is odd. Okay. If I'm on infinite medium, uh, I can have such solutions here, right? Meaning that your your squares were counter rotate. Were, you know, you have a phi positive on a, you know half of the chain, and then at x zero, uh, the, the phi will become uh, negative. Okay. Yeah. But but what I have here in the video, the ni the only thing is that the nice video has that we're on this kind of a frustrated case, but the that doesn't change the, the equation really, that just adds a constraint that forces the field to vanish, right? Yeah. So with that a topological constraint, uh, why the solution is like uh, hit a zero and then as a kink uh, comes up instead of having a section being negative phi? Uh, because <laughs> if you're, if you're, um, if you're uh, if you are a Mobius strip or if you're non-orientable, the field on, on the side, on the, you know, this is your loop zero L, right? The field has to be the same here and there. Or the field has to be... Uh, right, I... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, that depends how you define your convention, right? But if you want to define an elasticity theory, you don't want discontinuity. You know, so you, you could... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I get that so, part. I'm asking uh, yeah. why it can't be like a positive, negative, and then positive again. Ah, you could. You could? You could. You, you would have to cross zero three times, but you could. Okay, so yeah. it's like a, maybe it depends on the system size. Somehow this kink is a better solution? Uh, if you have uh, non orientable so if you have an odd number of squares, you always... You know, your lowest energy solution will be always one kink. Mm -hmm. La higher energy solution will be an odd number of kinks. Right? Okay, I see, I see. If you okay. have an even number of squares, lower energy solution is zero kink, but you can have two, four, six, and so on. Okay. All right. Actually, uh, so that, that's it. Actually, uh, Daniel here, has, uh, the, in his same paper with disorder, also has explored uh, solitons uh, that can emerge uh, also via boundary conditions in, in this uh, you know disordered Quanta. version disordered version of the of the of the do you have any move about the solitons I was curious to see how, how does it look like in the stars uh, yeah well the soliton is actually static because you know it's a vacuum bag you compress it doesn't move it's there Wait, so right. but the soliton usually I'm thinking about a soliton yeah. which is a yeah, it's moving, At, but an this, unwave that the, happens. Yeah. The, this one is, is actually this one is a this soliton is actually a goldstone mode, so you could actually move it very easily if you could. So if you would be able to squeeze the squares, you could like steer it around, and that's actually what we do uh, in in that in that paper on in the case of the ring. We actually move it around and actually achieve some form of mechanical memory with that. Uh, so you can make it move, but this soliton, you know, this this equation phi to the force also admits solitons that don't move. Right, so that's also a perfectly fine solution. And then the, the name came because soliton usually is a, is a, is a solution of, of, of a, uh, of a yeah, non-linear so equation. And the, so soliton is why are you calling soliton here? Well, I call it kink uh, because soliton I'm not allowed. I can only call it soliton when it's an integrable solution, which this is not. Oh, okay. But some, some equations are fully integrable, and, and there you may call them soliton, which is the case when your non-linear term, for instance, is a sign instead of the phi to the fourth. But, you know, colloquially, or, you know, you can. So the, the proper term is kink, I guess, yeah. For this one, do you have two solitons, or do you have one that wraps in? You have one that wraps. Oh, diagonally. interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm basically done. So this, uh, this field of solitons in, in metameter is actually quite, uh, quite uh, you know, there's quite a few papers that come. So this is uh, in the group of, uh, Katia Bertoldi, where they showed the soliton that move. Actually, this one is moving, you see. Uh, or uh, I think this is by Katia and Denis Kochman, where they have also like kind of a wave that move 
by virtue of inertia. You see. And so this is actually a very generic, uh, very generic uh, mechanism. There's also a group in Tsinghua University that has a slightly, a slightly closer to what I drew here, right? You, you have the slab and you push. Uh, and, and at some point you have a path of domain walls that emerge. Yes, you see? So here you have multiple solid domain walls that emerge. And you can actually describe them with the very same theory. Um, yeah, just to finish a few uh, teasers, we actually now in the lab add some dynamics with that. And so two way, in two ways, and that makes the bridge to tomorrow's lecture. So the one way in which you can add dynamics is to add uh, dissipation. And so uh, you may know this plant, uh, Mimosa pudica, which is very surprising the first time you see it. If you touch it, actually, there's kind of a transition wave from where you touch it to the inside, just folds up, right? Uh, and so now with our, our viscoelastic uh, kirigami, uh, Sharam, a postdoc in the group, uh, found it amusing to actually put these leaves on the kirigami <laughs> to, to demonstrate that what he has is a kind of a artificially or engineered version of the Mumiza pudica. The equation of motion here is uh, similar to this, except that you have a, a first order derivative and this is called the KPP equation, which describes reaction, reaction diffusion or excitable media. Uh, and we could show that this actually the very same equation through similar machinery. You can show that there's a very same, you know, a reaction diffusion equation in also in that mechanical system, which is nice. And uh, actually, what what is what we show is that since there's a mechanical wave that you can exploit, uh, we've been uh, we've managed to to use it to transport an object. Um, and so that's one way in which you can actually actuate the solitons. And the other way in which we're working also together with Xiaofei is to do that in active media. So I, I'm going to talk tomorrow about active media, non-reciprocal media. And so your dynamic can be active. You can inject energy in a unidirectional way. And that's a, just a teaser of tomorrow. Uh, basically, this is a chain of 50 robots that are uh, uh, straddled with elastic bands and coupled non-reciprocally. Non and what we have is a, you know, a, a version of this frankel kontorova uh, solitonic chain. And basically, oh, I just have to be patient. And what you see is that non-reciprocity biases dynamics in one way, and the soliton, the, you know, the topological nature of the soliton makes it robust. Usually, when you have an active medium, it blows up, it's controllable. But here, since you have a, a topological soliton, topological kink, it makes it easier to control uh, and to have a robust waveguide, essentially. Uh, and so you can play and send Morse codes and things like that with that if you want. But that's uh, that's basically the. That's basically uh, what brings me to the end, so thank you. Questions? Okay, I think we, we had plenty of questions during the lecture, thank you. And we don't have a, an exercise session in the afternoon, so after cough break, you're to head home. Yeah.